Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Welcome to this Oxford Martin lecture on a very special occasion when we have Amory Lovins with us. I think to many in this room here, his name stands both for a generation ahead of time. Um, I remember being a student at this university, Amory, and already being taught about your thinking. Um, it seems a, a short while ago, but it's quite a few years by now. And um, over the many years of having then worked in the field that is so close and uh, part of your life, uh, time and again, the Rocky Mountain Institute, your work, your thinking have shaped uh, not only the thinking of individuals, but really of a, of a whole generation. And I was thinking as I prepared to welcome you here today, what it must feel like when you look back over the last few decades and remember what it was like to try and envisage a world that today is actually, in some respects at least, becoming a reality and remembering how doubtful people were, how little faith they had perhaps in the capacity, not just of technology and science, but of people to begin to believe in possibilities that at that time seemed so remote. For us at the Oxford Martin School, it is a great honor and pleasure to welcome you back to Oxford and um, to introduce you today, not only as, and I have to make sure I get it all right, the co-founder, the chief scientist, the chairman emeritus of the Rocky Mountain Institute, and we proudly say also a member of the Oxford Martin School Advisory Council. Amory is a physicist, an energy advisor, um, a futurist, maybe that's a title you may not want to use, but in the sense of being able to see possibilities where others only see challenges and barriers, you have been part of designing, um, in so many respects, uh, integrative concepts of um, mobility, of super-efficient buildings, of factories. It has made you a trusted and honored advisor to so many governments, to enterprises, to non-governmental organizations across the world, and too many for me to mention here. But just to say, in the work that you have done, you have received already such great recognition amongst them the Blue Planet Prize, the Volvo Prize, the Zayed Prize, and to an audience here in Oxford, obviously, 12 honorary doctorates seems uh, quite an achievement in itself, so a few of us have <coughs> a little longer to go until we reach that point. But also Time Magazine has named him one of the world's 100 most influential people. This is just a little and microscopic selection of the many attributes that I could mention this afternoon. Many of you will be familiar with his books, Natural Capitalism in 1999, and most recently also Reinventing Fire in 2011, all of them bestsellers, and never looking back, but looking forward. It is therefore my great pleasure, Amory, to invite you today to speak about the disruptive oil and electricity markets. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Achim. A great pleasure to be back uh, and to have the honor of sketching for you some context about the energy transformation that we're all creating together. And uh, as I was mentioning just before this, I'm, I'm so thrilled that Oxford Martin School has brought together this extraordinary uh, group of talented and dedicated people to work on energy because um, when I resigned my junior research fellowship in Merton in 71, it was because they wouldn't let me do a doctorate in energy. They said, energy? What's that? It's not an academic subject, is it? We have to chair it, pick a real subject. And now I'm told this morning here that there are about 200 people on staff at the university who work one way or another on energy and a lot more if you count all those in the sciences and engineering whose work has important <laughs> implications for energy. So from two years before the Arab oil embargo in 73, up from roughly zero to hundreds now is very good progress. And I'm pleased with what I learned this morning here. Now, the, the expanding rev energy revolution I'll describe applies some wise advice from General Eisenhower to make tough problems soluble by expanding their boundaries to encompass more options and more synergies so they include what the solution requires. 
all four energy using sectors, transport, buildings, industry, and electricity, save more energy faster together than separately. And all four kinds of innovation, not just technology, but also design, not just public policy, but also new business strategy, can combine to create deeply disruptive game changers whilst the old energies, uh, the old uh, industries rather, are still putting on their boots. Ford's auto industry, Edison's electricity industry, and Rockefeller's oil industry changed the world. And if on one of their car camping holidays together, Ford and Edison took a very long nap and woke up and saw their businesses today, they would recognize almost everything except the electronics. And yet today their industries face vast disruptions. We've got 21st century technology and speed colliding head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. So let me sketch how the first two of these three great industries are coming together to eat the third, the oil industry. As we might imagine, Ford mischievously muttering to Edison, he didn't say that, I made it up. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's see what happens when electricity displaces petrol, and then those electric cars add flexibility and cheap distributed storage that help the grid accept variable solar and wind power, replacing giant power stations and their fossil fuels. Let me start on the demand side. Energy savings now deliver more global energy services than oil. And in the US since 75, they have saved 30 times as much cumulative energy, two thirds of it through smarter technologies, uh, as all renewables have added. But efficiency is just getting started. In 1975, US government and industry all insisted the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP couldn't fall. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in the next 50 years. So far, it's dropped 56% in 41 years. And yet, just the innovations already made by 2010 can save another threefold twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And seven years on, that looks conservative. That's partly because optimizing vehicles, buildings, and factories as whole systems can often make very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. For example, my wife Judy and I, I think she's here somewhere perhaps, uh, live here 2,200 meters up in the Colorado Rockies near Aspen, where temperatures used to go as low as minus 44 Celsius. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Um, super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and super windows that insulate like 16 or even 22 sheets of glass, but look like two and cost less than three, make it 99% passive solar heated 1% active solar, and eliminating the heating system more than paid up front for the efficiency that displaced it, and then saving about 90% of household electricity as well, still paid back in 10 months with 1983 technology. Now the central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm has so far produced 69 passive solar banana crops uh, and without needing to look like this, our house has helped inspire over 40,000 European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction costs. This turns out to work from Old Snowmass to Bangkok, a climate range that includes nearly everybody on Earth, but wherever you live, integrative design <coughs> gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the top center photo uh, has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Such integrative design is how our Empire State Building retrofit saved 38% of its energy with a three-year payback. But three years later, our cost-effective retrofit in Denver saved 70%, making this half-century-old federal office more efficient than the best new U.S. office which in turn is less than half as efficient as our own new 
net positive, no mechanicals office. And yet its technologies existed over a decade ago. What's mainly improved is not technology, but design, the way we choose and combine technologies. And that's not the end of the matter. Progress continues. This building in relatively cloudy Germany reportedly uses three-fifths less energy than our own new office, so that its rooftop solar cells are said to make nearly five times as much electricity as all three stories use. Can public housing retrofits become super efficient as well? Yes, and within another year, they should get cheap enough to finance entirely from saved energy whilst extending building life and improving amenity, health, and value. This whole retrofit has even been demonstrated to be installable in a single day whilst you're at work. Now, throughout buildings and industry, to give another example, low friction pipe and duct design could save roughly half the world's coal-fired electricity with extremely juicy returns. And yet such rearrangement of designers' metal furniture remains largely unnoticed because it's not a technology, it's a design method, forgotten since the Victorian era. At California's Oakland Museum, for example, our colleague Peter Rumsey retrofitted an efficient layout into the condenser water pumping loop, cutting pumping energy by three-fourths with a two- or three-month payback and eliminating 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. And then when he repiped the museum's chilled water loop and added variable frequency drives, he doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. And to help the pipe fitters understand how to minimize friction by making the pipes fat, short, and straight, he simply asked them to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains. Such savings have enormous leverage. From the coal burnt at the power plant to the end use, there are so many successive losses compounding that only a tenth of the energy in the coal comes out the, the pipe as flow. But if we now turn those compounding losses around backwards from right to left, every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe compounds back again to save 10 units of fuel cost emissions and global weirding back at the power station. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, so the total capital cost goes down. Now, both technology and design are moving efficiency into fast forward. Prior improvements in lighting efficiency are being swept away as LEDs in each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. Saving an eighth of the world's electricity, they're prying open an old crack in electric utilities business model. You see, Thomas Edison didn't sell electricity, he sold light, so that future lighting efficiency gains would cut his costs and increase his profits. But in 1892, Utilities switch to selling kilowatt hours, so efficient use cuts their revenues, not their costs. Utilities sell a commodity, but customers want an infrastructure or a service, like hot showers and cold beer, or perhaps in the UK, cold showers and warm beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, and oil and gas companies use the same flawed business model, selling molecules, not services, like comfort and mobility. So customer efficiency cuts their revenues, not their costs. This is a problem. It's called an upside down business model. Oh, by the way, what else changes this fast? Well, LEDs backwards are PVs, photovoltaics, which are now less capital intensive than Arctic oil. And in the past five years, the meteorite strike of their price has made solar and wind power often cost less than the dashed lines, which is the cost of fossil fuels fed into US power stations. And that's often made old coal, gas, and nuclear plants uneconomic to run. Now combine these two technologies, and we can transform the lives of 1.2 billion people with no electricity and little prospect of getting or affording grid electricity on a typical family income of $2 a day or less. So they use kerosene lamps that kill about 4 million people a year, would rank eighth among nations in carbon emissions, and burn $38 billion worth of kerosene a year. One-fifth of the total cost of global lighting to deliver very inefficiently uh, one-thousandth of the world's light. 
But now we can banish darkness so daughters and sons can learn to read. Uh, an entrepreneurial village woman can sell or lease an integrated photovoltaic LED lithium battery smart chip lighting package like this Dutch Waka Waka, uh, Swahili for shines brightly, which will shine for 10 hours on a day's charge in the sun uh, at that rate or 150 hours at that rate. And it pays back in weeks to months against kerosene. You can microfinance it by scratch cards or via the smartphone recharged off the USB port. And eliminating kerosene for that family is like a perpetual annuity giving an extra month's income a year. So which of these offerings is more exciting and lucrative and transformational? To which strategy would you entrust your company's fate, your portfolio's performance, or a common future? Choosing the disruptive energy future, enabling the new system, not protecting the old system, could just save the world. And it's not just about lighting. Berkeley Lab uses photovoltaics a third smaller than the panel shown to power 7,000 looks of LEDs, a mobile phone charger, a clock radio, a table fan, and a 56 centimeter color television. And their high efficiencies cut the, cut the total capital cost by half, empowering twice as many off-grid families for the same money and enabling cheap and highly reliable DC solar microgrids. Or to free the girls in those families from gathering wood and dung for cooking so they can study more, smarter pots could be at least as important as better cook stoves and perhaps culturally easier, although they're scarcely on the development agenda. Many of these proven improvements could be adapted by ingenious local metalsmiths to local skills and needs, designed cleanly and durably, and integrated with better cook stoves. Integrating all options, including good old ideas like lower heated mass, better insulation, direct immersion or contact, fast regulation, may together cut cooking energy by one or possibly two orders of magnitude before we get around to solar power or solar heat. Speaking of food, agriculture withdraws about 90% of India's water with electric pumps using about 19% of India's electricity. A connected load officially 100 gigawatts, actually probably one and a half times that, plus even worse diesel pumps that devour 60% of farm income and $3 billion a year in foreign exchange. But Indian field trials show how end-to-end -end redesign can improve efficiency by at least fivefold, take pumping off the grid, feed surplus solar power back into the grid, help make distribution companies solvent, and eliminate the $10 billion a year subsidy. That is, phase in the efficiency, phase out the subsidy, and you end up paying proper marginal cost, but your bill doesn't go up, and you're a solar farmer. Whenever you're not pumping, you feed power back to the grid, sell that. Uh, all these pieces now exist, some assembly required. What about the cities? Well, today's best air conditioners, twice as efficient as those often assumed for 30 years hence, could be leapfrogged and largely paid for by selling their load flexibility to the grid. And even better cooling methods can save upwards of 90% of the energy, but may not even be needed. Mid-rise apartments proven popular in the Indian monsoon uh, almost two decades ago, use passive convectively vented double walls and super efficient ceiling fans to keep you feeling about 16 or 17 Celsius degrees cooler uh, with, at just 2% higher construction cost. And with a few further refinements, they can deliver decent comfort with no air conditioning. Zimbabwe's biggest office and shopping complex, the Eastgate Center in Harare, with passive design inspired by termite mounds, uses 90% less mechanical energy to deliver the same or better comfort with normal construction cost and 20% lower rents. Or in India's hot and humid cities, Rohan Parikh's team at Infosys built every quarter uh, a 22,000 square meter office using 80% less energy than the Indian norm, a 10 or 20% lower capital cost, 60% less cooling capacity, superior comfort satisfaction. And the glare-free daylighting throughout is delivered by contract. If workers complain of glare and request blinds, the architect doesn't get paid. 
Now, if you add up savings like these, I've just happened to have picked Indian examples, plus others uncounted in old and new industries, India appears to have on the order of 1,000 gigawatts of profitable efficiency potential not in the current forecasts, not in the current models. And if efficiency gained the same focus and ambition that have made renewables beat coal in the past few years, India's vast solar potential and two or three terawatts of cost-effective wind power could profitably make it an energy surplus company now disguised as an energy deficit country. Completing the stranding of the roughly 50 gigawatts of coal plants in the pipeline and now often in course of suspension along with a few hundred gigawatts of pre-stranded coal assets in China. But competition for efficiency of renewables is just the start of fundamental disruptions emerging in every country, as we now see starkly in the EU and the United States. Because powerful disruptions are converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. These eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse uh, move fast. They don't just add, they exponentiate. They're not lone wolves, they hunt in packs. Sorry. They multiply quickly. They can gobble half of utility revenues in the 2020s. And together, they're creating an alien competitive landscape faster than most utility cultures can cope. Three years ago, all central power plants were called dinosaurs. And the full quote was, too big, too inflexible, not even relevant for backup power in the long run. Who said that? Was it Greenpeace? Not exactly. It was Union Bank of Switzerland. It's usually a good idea to sell customers what they want before someone else does. And customers are figuring out that they can use less electricity more productively and more timely, produce their own, and even trade it with each other. So Dutch customers can buy renewable electricity directly from other customers on this peer-to-peer -peer website of Van de Bron, literally from the source. A German utility executive I know living in Holland decided to buy his electricity from this guy because the price was right and it's a really cute piglet. <laughs> so at Christmas, he gets a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity supplier. What big utility can dream of such customer intimacy? <laughs> U.S. wholesale electricity prices are now widely undercut by the average long-term fixed prices of wind power and of solar power. And even without their temporary subsidies, generally smaller than the permanent subsidies to non-renewables, unsubsidized solar and wind power at or below three US cents a kilowatt hour, the graft here's asterisk, are now winning in global markets. And they keep getting better and cheaper. Uh, here's how the US wind resource rose by two thirds in seven years through better rotors and taller towers and better software. And this has spread competitive wind power from the dark blue to the light blue to the orange parts of the US to every state and also to every one of the German lender, obviating one if not both of its big transmission corridors because best renewables far away often can no longer beat uh, middle quality renewables nearby without the line cost. Modern renewables also scale up in a fundamentally different way. Traditionally, of course, we built giant cathedral-like power plants, each costing billions of dollars, taking many years to license and build. But now each year, with roughly the same capital, we can build a photovoltaic factory, which each year thereafter produces enough solar modules to produce each year thereafter as much electricity, a gigawatt year, as your cathedral ultimately will do. So solar output worldwide is scaling faster than cell phones. In 2013, China added more photovoltaic capacity than the total U.S. additions cumulatively in the previous 59 years. In 2016, China added twice that much, three football pitches per hour, including 11 gigawatts just in the month of June. And when renewables get cheaper, we buy more. So they get cheaper, so we buy more. And such expanding returns keep outrunning forecasters, as in these forecast fans from the International Energy Agency, they've gone up fivefold for wind power, 19-fold for photovoltaics, and yet they're still falling short of reality. In 2016 alone, modern renewables, that excludes big hydro dams, added 139 gigawatts, 55% of the world's new capacity. 
They got 242 billion US dollars of asset investment, two thirds of it private. In that year alone, the low bids for Mexican utility scale photovoltaics fell 37%. The low bids for European offshore wind fell 43%, all in less than a year. And yet we're still told that only coal, gas, and nuclear stations can keep the lights on because they're 24-7, whereas wind power and photovoltaics are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But variable doesn't mean unpredictable. Here's how accurately the French grid operator in a stormy winter month forecast a day ahead the actual output of the country's wind farms. I'll bet they wish they could forecast demand that accurately. Also, the reason we built the grid is that no generator is 24-7. Giant plants fail too, losing a billion watts in milliseconds, awfully, often abruptly for weeks or months. And grids, by design, manage this intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. But in exactly the same way, and often at lower cost, grids can manage the forecastable variations of solar and wind power by backing up those variable renewables with a portfolio of other renewables, all forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and by location. So in Texas, uh, which has no big hydro dams and is not connected to the rest of the United States, a 2050 summer weeks load shape can get much smaller and less peaky with efficient use. Then we can make 86% of its annual electricity with wind and photovoltaics, 14% from dispatchable renewables, all the rest. And this 100% renewable supply can then match the load by putting surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage worth buying anyhow, namely ice storage, air conditioning, and smart charging of electric autos. Then we can recover that distributed storage when needed and fill the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. And then only about 5% of the renewable output is left over to be spilt, so the economics should be excellent, given the prices I told you earlier. Uh, and some grid operators already do this today. In 2014, when Germany met 27% of its annual inland electricity needs from renewables, Italy was 33%, Ireland 20 France and Britain 19 But there were four other European countries with modest or no hydropower that met roughly half their uh, domestic electricity needs, that is all, all sectors, not exports, uh, <coughs> from renewables. <coughs> they added no bulk storage. They had superior reliability. In the case of Denmark and Germany, about 10 times better than US reliability. And in 2015, the ultra-reliable former East German utility, uh, 50 Hertz, got 49% of its electricity from renewables, three quarters of them variable photovoltaics and wind. So the operators have learned to run these grids the way a conductor leads a symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously creates beautiful music. And thus we have not just one way bulk storage in magenta, but about 10 ways to make the grid flexible and renewable. I've sketched these here using made up numbers, the rest of my numbers are real. Um, and they're, they're arranged in rough order of increasing cost, your actual costs will vary. But bulk storage comes last, not first. So we needn't wait for a storage miracle and the market isn't waiting. Now, sizing power generation to be fit for purpose is also vital to economics and resilience. What the economist calls micropower, that is renewables minus big hydro plus cogeneration, now makes a fourth of the world's electricity. It adds half the new generating capacity. Its most advanced national user is Denmark, uh, which in three decades has shifted from central power plants on the left in red, mostly coal burning, to distributed wind turbines in blue and distributed combined heat and power in brown, generally burning agricultural wastes. And Denmark is on track for 100% renewable energy of all kinds by 2050 at essentially no extra cost. 
It's also reorganizing its grid as a cellular network of islandable microgrids that normally interchange power freely, but if the grid fails, they can disconnect fractally, continue to serve critical loads from local supplies, and later resync and reconnect. The same resilient grid architecture with Chinese help enabled Cuba to reduce its serious blackout days from 224 days in 2005 to zero in 2007, and to sustain vital services the next year, even when two hurricanes in a fortnight shredded their eastern grid. Now, flexible loads, what we call flexiwatts, to go with megawatts, can shift electric power demand over time and space as grid operators, like the Texas grid, use Wi-Fi connected customer devices to flatten load shapes or even harness storage that's distributed in the thermal mass of buildings. So the supposedly problematic duck curve in Magenta of steeply ramping net load as photovoltaic output declines in the late afternoon goes away if we combine electric vehicles, home plug loads, residential and commercial, domestic hot water, and heating and cooling controls. And altogether, uh, these options can conveniently have uh, the summer daily load range uh, and save a quarter of the non-renewable capacity, make renewable energy a third more valuable. They pay back in about five months. In fact, adding flexiwatts to on-site generation and storage can give customers more market power than utilities have. A typical Hawaiian household uses appliances at different times of the 24-hour day, and roughly half those loads are under the yellow curve indicating the solar hours when the rooftop solar power is operating. But the utility, having tried and failed to prohibit solar hookups, wants to confiscate the leftover solar production without paying for it. Angry customers will probably then use smart appliances to move 80 or 90 percent of their household loads conveniently into the solar hours, costing the utility nearly all its intended windfall and most of its ordinary revenue. So this anti-solar tariff, like all six that we've studied in the U.S., turns out to be a very well-aimed boomerang that will actually speed and expand solar adoption by educating and annoying the customers so they leave the grid faster. Next, to make the grid an optional convenience, just add electric vehicles. They will enhance grid flexibility while saving money, oil, air, and climate. Their global sales grew 60% in 2015, 42% last year, when China sold more than the world sold in 2014 and launched tenfold growth during 2015 to 20. Now, Bloomberg expects EVs to save about 2 million barrels of oil a day in the next six or eight years. That's just enough to recrash oil prices about the time the new frontier projects come on stream. <coughs> and then Bloomberg expects another 13, or, or a, a saving of 13 million barrels a day by 2040 from electric vehicles. <coughs> That's <coughs> nine times the top forecast by ExxonMobil. They, can, they can't both be right. And those forecasts did not count India or Germany or Holland targeting 100% EVs by 2030. And they didn't fully count four EV accelerators. Ultralighting, which saves up to two thirds of the costly batteries. Fee baits, <clears throat> that is when you buy a new car, you pay a fee or get a rebate, which and how big depends on how efficient it is. The fees pay for the rebates. Uh, those have helped make a third of Norway's new cars electric, 50 times the U.S. share. Policy does matter. <coughs> Monetizing EV's value as a grid resource. That's worth enough to repay up to half the total cost of the vehicle. And shareable autonomous mobility as a service business models, <coughs> whose high asset utilization strongly advantages electric traction. Now, as batteries nearly fourfold, or GM says fivefold, price drop in the past five years continues. It'll drive EVs to sticker price parity in the 2020s. Lithium battery production will approach a terawatt hour per year. We'll end up with abundant cheap batteries, distributed solar everywhere, gas industry distress, and vast distributed storage and demand flexibility. 
It's going to make the grid work a lot better if we do it right. Now, EVs become cheaper and can spread faster if we first make autos two or three times more efficient. The carbon fiber <coughs> electric cars <coughs> that I invented 25 years ago, we designed 17 years ago, Toyota used our methods 10 years ago to design as a threefold lighter Prius size plug in hybrid. Those entered the market four years ago uh, from Volkswagen and from BMW, and, and that's the one I drive. Uh, it's already profitable, and BMW says its carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. An improved manufacturing process our team developed and sold to a tier one uh, made this carbon cap uh, <coughs> a decade ago in one minute. And now, well, let's see, try that. You can tell it makes a pretty good temple bell. Um, we can pass it around as long as I get it back. Uh, uh, and don't worry about dropping it. It's tougher than titanium. Oh, good fit. Sort of 1914 Italian style of fashion. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, we sold that technology to Diefenbacher in Germany, and uh, they've already made it three and a half fold faster. So it can now do a two by two meter complex carbon fiber part in, in uh, one minute. And if you made all US autos this way, just that technology would save one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC worth of oil at a cost under $10 per saved barrel. Because it turns out the ultralighting is approximately free. It's paid for by radically simpler automaking with 80% less capital uh, and by a two-thirds smaller propulsion system. But meanwhile, autos are morphing from pigs, that is, personal internal combustion, gasoline, steel-dominated vehicles, to SEALs, shareable electric autonomous lightweight service vehicles. And these two changes in technology and three in business model are all simultaneous. They're all mutually reinforcing. They're all in play. And India and China are radically speeding this global mobility revolution as the US nears peak car ownership in the next five years, brewing up a perfect storm for the auto and oil industries. Something very like this actually occurred over one and a half centuries ago when there were no cars and no oil wells. Most oil was extracted from whales and burnt in lamps. And whaling was America's fifth largest industry, and yet in a single century it grew to world dominance and then suddenly vanished. What happened? Well, strong demand and global hunting made whale, whales shy and scarce. Costs rose as fleets got bigger but less productive, so prices got volatile and shot past those of coal oil. Lamp conversion kits emerged. Michael Dietz's clean burning model paid back in months and it flipped the market in three years. So in the nine years before Drake struck rock oil or petroleum in Pennsylvania, whale oil lost over five sixths of its lighting market. The whalers were astounded to run out of customers before they ran out of whales. The remnant whale populations were saved by technological innovators and profit maximizing capitalists until those same forces of industrialization killed even more whales in the 20th century. So today, energy efficiency is oil's biggest and cheapest competitor. A uh, paper I did three years ago for Shell called Efficiency, the Rest of the Iceberg, explains how oil companies can run their supply-side tankers in the, into the hidden efficiency iceberg and sink without even knowing what they hit because they weren't properly tracking modern efficiency, so it wasn't on their chart. Now, which oil and gas markets are in danger of such disruption? Nearly all of them. Over decades, reserves unburnable for climate reasons could well prove smaller than reserves unsellable for competitive reasons. That is, oil companies are even more at risk for market competition than from climate regulation. If the oil business sputters at $90 a barrel and swoons at 50, how will it do against the less than $20 cost of getting US mobility completely off oil? What if the biggest challenge weren't falling price, but vanishing demand? 
You see, autos aren't just heading for four to eight-fold higher efficiency, including electrification. They're also being driven less. Many, small, uh, many young people don't even want to own one because it's cheaper and easier now not to, uh, especially now that smartphones bridge those once annoying route gaps by summoning ubiquitous transport services on demand. And if you ever do need a car, you needn't own it, just as you can eat a great meal without owning the restaurant. Uh, in some Chinese cities, hiring a Conti EV from this giant vending machine costs about $3 an hour. Also, hiring shared cars when you need them can boost their 5% asset utilization by about tenfold, and then nearly redouble it with partly or fully autonomous businesses, uh, vehicles. Because autonomy drops the electric vehicle's total cost per kilometer to about two-fifths below that of fueled vehicles, even at US petrol prices. Because they're driven so many more kilometers that their far lower energy cost per kilometer more than offsets any initially higher purchase price. Competitive starting this year or next year, this mobility <laughs> IT mashup means radically fewer vehicles disrupting automakers and all electric vehicles driving fewer total kilometers, further disrupting oil companies. It can save Americans over a trillion dollars and tens of thousands of lives a year, and the ultimate global net present value saving is probably above $10 trillion. Meanwhile, the rules are changing. In 2010, nearly half the world's new cars were sold in China, where only 5% of people owned one. And yet this 100-kilometer traffic jam took 12 days to unsnarl. So the politicians figured out that building roads causes traffic. And they started changing the rules to ensure the drivers get what they pay for, but pay for what they get. Non-automotive mobility is also improving. Bus rapid transit uh, transform this Hondro Street to that street, same one, uh, while carrying 800,000 riders a day. And it can achieve subway route density at 5% the cost. And it now carries more than 30 million commuters in nearly 200 cities. China, by the way, also has over 200 million electric bicycles. And urban design is also changing. China plans in the next 15 years to build new cities for as many people as America has. And so far, it's designed cities around cars with an arterial vehicle network. But integrating and distributing where people live, work, shop, and play means they needn't travel far nor by car. So adopting a capillary web designed around feet, not tires, means two-thirds less driving and one-third less concrete. It builds a human ecology with vibrant commerce, rich social life, equal or better throughput, cleaner air, and happier citizens. And the 53 cities already doing this, and more to come, will use little oil. The same physics and the same business logic also apply to heavy vehicles. <clears throat> we helped Walmart's heavy lorry fleet save half its fuel per case in a decade. That does improve smarter, or include smarter logistics. But current technology alone can profitably make heavy lorries three or four times more efficient. And that plus the same for airplanes already designed at Boeing, NASA, and MIT can move about $0.9 trillion net present value from oil companies' top lines just to Americans' pockets. And of course, the technologies are globally fungible. Now, in both heavy and light vehicles, today's US military revolution in energy efficiency will speed these advances in the civilian sector, which uses over 50 times more oil much as military R&D created the internet, the global positioning system, the jet industry, engine industry, the microchip industry, only this time speeding the journey beyond oil so warfighters can have nega missions in the Persian Gulf. Mission unnecessary. They really like that idea. So even in the US, where our cities are already built around cars, <clears throat> and without the pigs to seals transition or other recent innovations, we can greatly enhance mobility, as you see in the subtitle, whilst phasing out oil with an internal rate of return well above 17%. We can first save three-fourths of mobility energy by technologies that are included or overlooked in the official forecast. We can use vehicles more productively, getting the same access from 46 to 84% less driving through new urbanist design, IT integration, and charging real-time driving costs per kilometer, not per liter. 
but then we could switch fuels. Super efficient autos can use any mixture of hydrogen fuel cells, electricity, and advanced biofuels. Heavy lorries and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen. Lorries could even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. And any biofuels needed, just the little orange wedge at the bottom, less than 3 million barrels a day, could be made two-thirds from waste without displacing cropland or harming climate or soil. Meanwhile, by 2050, at historically reasonable rates, U.S. buildings can triple or quadruple their energy productivity, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. The savings are worth four times their costs. And industry can accelerate, too, and double its energy productivity with a 21% IRR. Now, combining those vehicle building and industrial efficiencies, which are well documented in our 2011 business book, Reinventing Fire, uh, if, if you put those together, you find trebled U.S. energy efficiency and quintupled renewables by 2050, needing no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, a third less natural gas, while saving $5 trillion, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening national security, and cutting fossil carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent. And yet we found this would need no new inventions and no act of Congress. But with smart city and state policies, where we make our energy policy anyway, it could be led by business for profit. And that's actually what's happening so far. The first six years of this 40-year journey are on track, not because Congress made a coherent policy, but because the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. And these best buys are also the most effective solutions to big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. Now, if you like any of these many outcomes of reinventing fire, you can support this transition without needing to like every outcome or agree which outcomes are most important. So focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. Stimulated by those U.S. findings at the G20 seven months ago, uh, China's National Development and Reform Commission published its roadmap for China's energy revolution, aided by Berkeley Lab Energy Foundation, China, and Rocky Mountain Institute. And it details how China can save about $3.5 trillion run a seven-fold bigger economy in 2050 than in 2010 while using only as much energy as today, but seven times more productively, shift supply two-thirds off fossil fuels in the electricity sector, 83%, with 69 coming from renewables, emit 42% less carbon from a seven-fold bigger economy, burn 80% less coal, get 13 times more GDP, from each ton of fossil carbon. Our customers for this work were the energy authors of the 13th five-year plan. So it strongly informed that plan, and we're now off and running. So if you extrapolate these on-track U.S. findings in the market and the adopted Chinese findings in, national, uh, findings in national strategy to the other half of the world, cross-checking against similar European results, you find that the world could achieve about a two Celsius degree climate trajectory whilst providing the same or better energy services at a net present valued cost about $18 trillion cheaper. And then reinvesting in natural systems carbon removal could get to about a one and a half degree trajectory, still with trillions of dollars left over, plus huge positive externalities. And presumably making climate protection not costly but profitable should simplify the politics. In both electricity and hydrocarbons, the incumbent supply industries face existential risks from such futures that they may not expect. And managers are understandably focusing on the daily need for price to exceed cost. But many forget the other part of the business condition, that value must exceed price. If competitors offer a superior value proposition and grab your revenues, it doesn't matter if you can profitably sell what your former customers are no longer buying. 
Managing this risk and the rapid cultural change it requires is a formidable leadership challenge. As Jack Welch said, if the rate of change on the outside is greater than the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And when that value proposition changes, markets can flip with breathtaking speed, as Tony Siba illustrates. If you look down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Anyone see it? 13 years later, you have to look even harder for the last horse, and I'm not at all convinced there is a horse in this picture. <laughs> the horse and buggy industry thought it had decades to adapt, but Henry Ford's Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car-owning households soared from 8 to 80% in a decade, three-quarters of them financed by a GM and DuPont financial innovation called car loans. Well, today, our solar modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three quarters of our rooftop solar is innovatively financed, and Ford's and Edison's industries are merging. Horse and buggy thinking is dangerous, but it's still rather common. As the late ex-oilman Marie Strong said, not all the fossils are in the fuel. But DuPont's ex-chairman, Edgar Woolard, reminds us that firms hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because they simply won't be around long term. They're forgetting that the pace of transformation, as these pictures so dramatically show, is set not by incumbents, but by insurgents, who are not inhibited by the incumbent's business models, cultures, or legacy assets. And investors flee even before customers do. Capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. And once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and invest in your successors. That is now underway. Here's the relative share price performance of one new and two old automakers. <clears throat> 2003 startup called Tesla has surpassed Ford's and now GM's market cap while selling 1% as many cars. And Ford, in consequence, sacked its CEO and put in a transformational leader. The energy transformation I've summarized is not just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution was the age of carbon, creating our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now this obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecoms and software turn people from isolated to networked and systems from dumb to smart. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely applicable, uh, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. And silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. I hope these remarks will stimulate a lively conversation. Let's see what's on your mind, and thank you all for your good work and your kind attention. Avery, thank you so much. This was um, a head-spinning uh, journey through uh, an age of transformation and, and transition. I have to say, I'm wondering if you are getting slower or, or the present is catching up faster with the future that you envisage because it's in much, of years. You, <laughs> yeah. much of what you have described is really about the present catching up with where, with where you had already seen technology being available. And so I hope in our discussion and, and the questions right now, we can explore a little bit if it is so bleeding obvious. What is it? that explains the inertia, but I'm sure there will be many questions. Let me just uh, make you aware that in um, our discussion, as well as the lecture, it is being live webcast, so we have a global audience following us, and therefore I would be grateful if you could uh, wait until you have a microphone and um, then speak and, and um, have your question or comment to Amy Lovins. Who would like to kick off the discussion? Let me start here. Yeah, I'm sure I said nothing controversial. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. May I ask, uh, which country will lead this? Will it be China, the United States, or someone else? 
And um, how long before the first oil company goes bust, the first big one? Uh, currently led by China. They are the world leader in, I believe, eight kinds of renewables that tend to be in all, are out investing the US by more than the factor two and pulling ahead or pulling away. And of course, China and later India will happily occupy any commercial space uh, vacated by the US. Although I think the uh, US election will have surprisingly little effect on energy and climate policy because that's made mainly at a state or even a local level and in the marketplace. Uh, we don't do very much federal energy policy and the Secretary of Energy doesn't have statutory authority to do what he wants to do. He's unlikely to get it. Um, when an oil company goes bust, well, of course, a lot of small, smaller ones have and others have combined, some at times of distress. Uh, I think it's hard to say. They're, the sheep and goats are starting to separate and I'd say you know, the, the ones that most get it and are adapting a strategy accordingly, I'd probably rank high Statoil, Total, and Shell. Um, and we pretty well know who the other ones are. Uh, and often there's, there's internal dissonance at, at a very large oil company where I've had a couple of chats with the strategists at, at some length. The engineers reached strikingly similar conclusions to what I've told you about the demand side. It's the economists who didn't get it, and I just had to leave them arguing with each other. Uh, but eventually, the economists will get it because their demand will go away. I mean, this this object we're passing around, remember, is uh, half an OPEC at under ten dollars a barrel. Not easy to compete with, and very difficult to stop. Again, the technologies are globally fungible. We did a report um, quite uh, recently, just published a month, less than a month ago, <clears throat> which is on the website rmi.org to give you a notion of how quickly things are moving, uh, called India Leaps Ahead. This is a joint effort of Niti Aayog, the, uh, the Indian uh, strategic planning agency chaired by the Prime Minister and uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. And this does the full uh, mobility IT mashup. And this came out of a conversation <clears throat> with the energy minister, uh, the remarkable Piyush Goyal, uh, 15 months, 16 months ago, in which he asked if we could help figure out how to make all Indian personal mobility electric by 2030. Well, it's a worthy ambition, and because of the amazing things he's pulled off in renewables and LEDs. We had to take the ambition very seriously, so of course we were honored to help. And with 75 senior government of India and, and private sector leaders, came up with some very interesting recommendations which they've now announced are Indian policy. It's amazing how fast these things can move when it's hard to breathe and you can't afford the oil imports and uh, worried about <coughs> uh, climate and uh, you know there, there are national security issues around the oil and suddenly all the policy needs converge. Uh, so I, I think if you if you look carefully at what's happening in China and India uh, in particular you can feel quite sanguine about how quickly this will move and perhaps a little more alarmed about how quickly the supply industries need to move. Many of them are not yet, so I, I worry about that. And we may I just ask you for a moment, I mean, about 12, 14 years ago, I think it was, we had some of the leading oil companies, in a sense, trying to step into this future. You remember BP, Beyond Petroleum, Shell and others, and, you know, stepping into a very different energy future, essentially about providing energy services, and then retreated again. Well, what happened there? Because that, in part, also speaks to large capital corporations struggling, obviously, with entering into this age of possibility. Well, you have a, a saying in America that the pioneers get the arrows, the settlers get the land. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 
some of, you know, some of what Lord Brown did was a bit too early for his culture. Uh, and similar challenges have arisen in other companies. But I think there's now a much more serious effort driven by actually more generational change within the companies themselves. Uh, and things have to be done in a certain way in each supply industry culture. Uh, but it's pretty clear to many people now that if they keep on doing what they're doing, they, they won't stay in business. You, you see this in the European utilities that lost half their market cap in five years, and now some of the biggest ones have split uh, into a kind of good bag, bad bag, <clears throat> and are doing fundamentally different strategies. That has to come also to the hydrocarbon industries. But none of them yet is fully coming to grips with the upside-down business model, the need to provide services so that customer efficiency cuts costs, not revenues. Yes, um, let me take uh, the gentleman at the back, followed by the lady, and then who was the hand here just now? Yes, uh, so right at the back, thank you. Um, the efforts to try and secure oil led to a lot of wars. Even now, I would say a lot of the discontent and manoeuvring in the Middle East is a result of manoeuvring for oil resources. It How wouldn't do you be going things? on if they just grew broccoli. Yeah. Um, 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 I believe a lot of the rare earths uh, are in the region of China because of a, uh, a, a geological event 250 odd million years ago. Um, and uh, these materials are needed for batteries and solar panels and the like. How do you see things developing on a global scale in terms of the um, efforts of the different countries to try and get their hands on these resources? As it happens, about a fortnight ago, I published an article on that subject in Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists so you can find it online. I think it's still free for the next fortnight or so. Uh, and having a background in, in economic geology, uh, I, I'm actually not concerned about that issue. If you add up the normal process where price elicits exploration uh, and loop closing and substitution, uh, you find in, in the rare earth story and others like it, that this is actually not a serious concern. Uh, and I won't try to summarize the article here, uh, but it, the rare earth thing turned out to be a stock hype and I actually called it um, maybe six or eight months before the crash to, to general ridicule. Uh, but it, it, was, it was simply a commodity bubble driven by people who didn't know very much about what the stuff was used for. Uh, for example, uh, there's still a lot of literature saying that you must have rare earths for high performance motors and generators. Not true. Uh, there isn't any rare earth in a Tesla in either the batteries or the motors. They use straightforward Tesla invented asynchronous or induction motors. Uh, you can also do switch reluctance motors that also have no magnets, and they can match or beat the performance of a permanent magnet motor. It's not an issue if you actually understand motor technology. And there are some terrific experts on that, of course, here, I think. Malcolm, are you in the room? <laughs> no. uh, <clears throat> I think the, uh, there are a few uses that are not easily substitutable, like erbium in fiber optic repeaters, but the uses are extremely small. And generally, the substitution has worked out really well. And actually, enough R&D has been stimulated that it looks like we'll get even better permanent magnets with no rare earths, the iron nitride approach, uh, which nobody had quite expected. There, there are some materials issues that are uh, more concerning for the long run, uh, some with cobalt, some with phosphorus. Uh, but again, there are, there are workarounds for all the, all the metallic ones. The phosphorus is simply a symptom of unsustainable designs of agriculture that we need to deal with for many other reasons. 
and fortunately we have good ways to do that. Thank you. Just to also let you know, for those of you in Oxford, in November, the Oxford Martin School, together with the Viola Institute, will be hosting an international conference on materials, minerals, metals, and resource availability in the low-carbon economy. So um, this topic, obviously, will, will receive further attention. Uh, there was a lady at the back there, Caroline, yeah, just on the right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the phrases I'm increasingly hearing, and you mentioned it as well, is um, abundant cheap batteries. And to some extent, it, it makes me excited, but it also makes me a little bit scared because I wonder how many thoughts are actually spared on the waste management of these, of these I'm new I'm not quite hearing it, I'm technology. sorry. Okay. Um, so, so the phrase abundant cheap batteries, you, you mentioned that as well as in your talk, and as, as much as it makes me excited, it's also a little bit scary because I'm not sure how much thoughts are actually spared on the waste management of these technologies. And um, I mean, thinking that things that are typically very, very cheap are also not valued very highly, I'm just wondering how really environmentally benign these new systems could be that contain a lot of this. Yeah, well, Professor Jurjagwala from Madras was telling me last week that uh, there's already a company profitably recycling laptop batteries uh, for recovery of upwards of 95% of lithium, cobalt, manganese. Uh, and they'll be happy to take any kind of lithium battery from anywhere in the world and do the same thing. And uh, he said the 95% is just, you know, first cut of the problem. They can do a lot better than that. So again, if, if the material is valuable, uh, it will be scavenged and recovered, and it will be designed for easy recovery. There are, of course, other battery chemistries emerging that don't have uh, any costly materials in them. They're made of things like aluminum, sodium, zinc, manganese. Uh, and there are some approaches with very high ionic conductivity polymer electrolytes that are quite exciting and can use a wide range of common chemistries. So I, I think the lithium battery is not the end of the line at all. Emery, you may not be aware, or well, you are aware of the Brexit vote, but you may not be aware of how important the toaster was in this debate about Brexit, because I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the toaster was actually one of the driving factors in making people feel that Europe was taking over sovereign decision-making about what toaster you buy, because the European Commission, as some of you are aware, had developed eco-design guidelines and energy efficiency guidelines about house appliances, and um, it was UKIP that then used the toaster, and therefore bureaucrats in Brussels uh, dictating what toaster you could buy in the UK in the future is one of the arguments to persuade people to vote for Brexit. So sometimes it may not be in the waste management, it may be in the politics or the psychology of why is efficiency something that we need to regulate for or incentivize for. Um, you may comment later also because often you speak to the forces of the market, but sometimes the market also needs regulatory incentives. And, and this is a classic example of how a toaster became a very uh, important part of the debate about... We had a similar exit. one about incandescent lamps. There you are. Um, the gentleman here, yes, with the blue shirt. And by the way, in case you're uh, um, wondering, we will finish in about five minutes, and there is some wonderful drinks waiting for you outside, and you will be able to continue also to, to speak to Amory then. Thanks. Um, Amory, you paint this incredible picture of technology innovation, falling costs, efficiency, new business models, and the opportunity for this enormous value creation. So is, uh, is carbon pricing uh, an irrelevance? Can, it, can we do this thing without putting a price on carbon? Is well, the market going to drive yeah, it naturally? Ev everything I described with the US and Chinese reinventing fire analyses assumed zero carbon price. But of course, zero is not the right number. I would love to have a carbon price, and then it would all be even more lucrative and go faster. So that would be very helpful. Yes, gentleman here. Um, it's interesting to speculate on the economics of all of this. Um, and in one analysis, it will all end up being wonderfully deflationary, oh. um, in the sense that everything will get cheaper. All of these services will become massively cheaper. Um, value will be created, but in fact probably far more value will be destroyed than is created. And 
Why do um, you the, think so? In the, the sense that there is this massive incumbency of heavy industries of all kinds, you know, in, in fossil fuels, in steel, and so on, um, energy intensive industries, um, uh, um, which actually add up to a huge part of the economy um, and a huge part of employment. And I can see, you know, potentially that in fact, far more capital value may un end up being destroyed by it than is, than is created in these upsurging industries where competition and falling prices will actually produce industries which are in which well, in aggregate have a uh, lower reason, capital value and probably employ fewer people. Okay, so thank you. I understand now the argument, but I'm not sure of the evidence because I think these the industries you describe are a surprisingly small part of the modern economy, uh, and it's the other way around, I suspect. I, I don't know the UK numbers. I know in the US we have uh, three times as many jobs in the solar as in the coal industry, for example. Uh, we have more jobs in efficiency and renewables than in all of the fossil fuel industries. So. Then, of course, if you look at the risk in those businesses, uh, it, it gets to be much more interesting to figure out what skills do they have that society will want to pay for over the long run. You know, if you're very good at drilling holes in the ground, there are some applications that, that can use that skill. If you're good at building offshore platforms, that's probably good for offshore wind. But it's not a, a terribly good fit uh, if you look across the whole spectrum of what the hydrocarbon industries are really good at because they're really good at managing large, extremely complex projects and not that many of them, whereas what the market is increasingly wanting is a lot of small projects. That's a big cultural shift, and I think that's probably the biggest cultural challenge in pulling this off. Uh, but Think about it for a moment from the perspective of the electricity industry. If you're <clears throat> facing those eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse and you're a standard big utility, let's see, an unwise posture would be ostrich, you know, keep calm, bury head in sand, uh, because head in the sand, rump in the air, all that's missing is the kick me sign. You could do the sloth posture, hang on hard and hope it will all blow past. That's not likely to work because you'll lose financial flexibility. But there are some intelligent responses you could use. You could buy the insurgents and offer their products as your own branded offering. You could do other kinds of coopetition. You could be a technically neutral integrator of all qualified offerings running the grid. You could, of course, finance the transition. You could lease, build, own, operate, whatever, stuff on the other side of the meter where you have to move in order to sit on the same side as the customer. And those are not mutually exclusive options. So this is exactly the direction that the new parts of E.ON and FAA and JDF Suez and, so, and NL are going in. JDF Suez has, last I heard, 80,000 people selling and delivering efficiency services. Not bad. Uh, those kinds of transitions will come to the hydrocarbon industry. It just takes a little longer, but I think it has to happen pretty quickly in view of the rather urgent demand threats that I described. A last question from the left back side of the room, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm a huge fan. Um, I just wanted to ask, you didn't mention anything about behavioral change or sort of our changing our relationship to our energy system, which I think is a pretty important element of this, both in terms of rebound effects and other second order effects that come with efficiency. So what is the role of, uh, of behavioral change or sort of changing our relationship with our energy system in terms of the way we think about it? How important is that? It can be quite important. Uh, it's not something that my group has worked on very much because Basically, we're not comfortable telling other people how to live. Uh, we, we try to set example, but uh, particularly in our society, this is very much a matter of individual choice. But I think there's a great deal we're learning from behavioral economics and behavioral science that can come into play. Uh, and 
is very trans-ideological in appeal. Uh, the, um, you mentioned rebound, uh, which, of which I think altogether too much has been made. Uh, it has a real effect. It's typically a few percent effect where you can measure it at all. Uh, and it certainly doesn't get to the level of backfire where you, you lose more than the saving. Uh, that would be impossible. So we do count it in our analyses to the extent it's justified by convincing literature, but that turns out to be quite small. So, y'all, you, know, you should pay attention to it, but not much. There are much more important things to worry about. Avery, <laughs> may I pose a last question to you? If you were to point to where possibility meets scaling up in the last few years. You've clearly pointed to the energy sector, the electricity infrastructure sector as one of them. Mobility vehicles being another one that clearly is emerging now into you know, a scale of changing not only the technology, the footprint. What other sectors or what other frontiers do you see being part of that low carbon economy emerging in the next few years that have takeoff potential? Well, natural systems, farming, forestry, uh, grazing, have huge potential uh, to save money and carbon at the same time. And there, you know, one is up against the same kinds of entrenched incumbencies as in energy, but perhaps even more built into the fabric of regulation. Uh, we've been giving some thought at Rocky Mountain Institute to what is causing and what can drive even faster the super linear scaling, the exponential scaling of the energy transformation. And we suspect that a lot of it comes from hidden interactions between different sectors of the economy, some tangent, some quite remote from each other. So we're starting to map those connections to see which can be reinforced or sped up and which perhaps can be called into existence uh, when they're not there now. I'll give you a, a very simple-minded example. Uh, products like the smartphone are made by companies that will pay Let's see, without giving the numbers, uh, they will pay you enough if you're a battery maker for a battery with, say, a fifth more energy per unit volume that it gives you an order of magnitude more profit. So as a battery maker, you are highly incentivized to innovate <coughs> um, denser batteries. But that then makes possible cost-effective electric cars, and then when you put thousands of batteries in each car, you make so many of them that they get cheap, and then you start having distributed storage and distributed solar all over the place, and then you get a distressed natural gas industry uh, and uh, pushing coal plants up the merit order curve so they don't run many hours, and then they have to be shut down because they can't make money. There's all these ripple effects spreading out in an intricate web uh, and I think if we understand those connections a lot better, we'll find that the sum is very much more than the parts. Uh, and this is, and, and, and farmers' work at Santa Fe Institute and others on expanding returns comes to displace in many, many places the Ricardian economics that was all based on limited resources of land or other physical things. Uh, <clears throat> there are now hundreds of industries that display expanding returns, not diminishing returns to scale. And yet this is still a subject that makes economic theorists very uncomfortable. It makes their models blow up. It makes their heads hurt. They don't want to think about it at all. Uh, and there are some good economists around who are starting to figure this out, and I think it's the next conceptual revolution in economics that is going to... Uh, get us off the big mistake about climate policy, which is assuming that climate solutions are costly, but actually they're profitable. Uh, it was a basic sign error 
that came from assuming that markets are essentially perfect already, or at least market failures are unimportant, and therefore if we're going to use energy a lot more efficiently or buy it from some cleaner source, it's going to cost more. And then the only question is how much do we have to raise the price to make this attractive by taxation or whatever, which we then count as a cost. No, this is all daft. It doesn't actually work that way. Uh, you have over $100 billion industries in solar, in wind power, in efficiency that are proving it wrong every day. And uh, I'm just hoping that this word reaches more policymakers rather quickly uh, so that they don't keep assuming cost where actually there's profit. But um, surely there are huge can we continue that in our reception, that's, that's a good thing for our I, I have to wrap us up because also we have to um, let the world, so to speak, part. Let me just... Um, <laughs> Henry, you... Um, you can see that we can continue with the whole seminar series, but it, your last answer also gave me a bridge to just say two things. Part of the Oxford Martin School, also together with the Institute of New Economic yes. Thinking here, is precisely about addressing these linkages. And uh, therefore, your presence here, I hope, will continue to inspire us, many researchers. And I also want to use this as a way of paying tribute to the vision that Jim Martin had when he set up this school precisely to move from the question of can we do it to how can we actually get it done. And that gives me an opportunity also to acknowledge the presence of Lillian Martin and Jaron who are here with us today as tomorrow the advisory council of the Oxford Martin School will meet here in Oxford. Emery, thank you for a fantastic afternoon. Thank you for your life's work and may many more years uh, be there for us to follow you and your thinking and may many others follow your thinking in the future. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The drinks are served.